Okay, welcome to another Orbiter 2010 video. And this video is another installment in my Absolute Beginner Guide, the video series that has the special focus on people who are brand new to Orbiter. Now, this in this part of the Absolute Beginner Guide, we're learning how to use Transex. And on that note, it's very important that you've already watched the first several videos that I did on Transex for how to go from the Earth to the Moon, and then how to go from the Moon to the Earth. The reason it's so important that you've seen those videos already is because I spent a lot of time in those videos explaining just the fundamental aspects of Transex, you know, how to do the different views, how to use the variables, and all those things. I can't go into those explanations in every single video or else we would never get anything accomplished. So in this part of the, in this part of the guide where we're learning how to use Transex to go to Mars, uh, it's, I'm already assuming that you know the basics of how to navigate around Transex. Now, I'm not assuming that you're an expert, so I, I will take things slow. But I can't, uh, again, I can't spend all the time on every video for, you know, this is what VAR does and this is what VW does. I can't do that. Now, in the last video, we set up our plan for how to go from low Earth orbit to Mars. And uh, the, the plan that we came up with probably wasn't the most efficient plan that we could have, but we'll take it uh, because as absolute beginners, we, you know, we kind of tend to want to learn how to accomplish a task. Then we'll go back and we'll learn how to refine that task over time. So we could have spent a lot more time, you know, fiddling around and getting, getting a lower delta V cost and maybe a better time of flight or whatever. But again, when you're, when you're brand new, I would say just take whatever you can get. And then as, as and then as you complete it and you have that success, it's gonna it's gonna generate excitement. You're gonna be like, wow, you know, I did it. I went all the way to Mars. And then you're gonna want to go back and uh, do the flight again. And if you see that you can save, you know, 300 delta V, that's huge. That's a big savings, and you'll be really happy about that. All right, let's go ahead and switch camera views here. And hopefully, I can get through this video. I've already been interrupted once by a phone call, so I'm starting over. Now. One thing I'll mention, um, because of the interruption, you didn't get to see something I did. There, Notice down here, again, the time of flight is 179.5 days, basically 180 days. One thing I did, uh, if I press control down arrow, you can see here that we have 198 days of locks instead of whatever it was before. <clears throat> and that's because I drained off a little bit of the locks. And that, the only reason I did that is because I don't want to carry any more locks than I really have to have. And carrying an additional 40 days is way too much, in my opinion. And even 20 days is a, is a, is a bit much. But 20 days is pretty good. You know, even 5 or 10 is fine. You don't want to cut it all the way down to the minimum because you, when you do mid-course corrections, it's going to change the time of your flight ever so slightly. And you may end up arriving at Mars a day or two later than you thought you would. And you might, if that's the case, you could run out of locks if you cut it all the way down to the minimum. So it's a good idea to carry a few extra days, maybe a week or 10 days. But any more than that, and you're really just starting to weigh the vessel down for no good reason. Now, the way you, the way you drain locks is just by clicking this button down here where it says hold for locks dump. Just click that and hold it. I'll do it briefly just to show one day. Morning. There, we got rid of one day. Now click it again and it shuts it off. So we just got rid of like a day and a half or so of locks. So that's one thing you can do. And now we've got 195 and we need about 180. So we've got like 15 extra days, which is plenty. Okay. Now for the second part of the setup, once we have, uh, you know, this part done, we'll, we'll shift our attention to the other, to the other side, to, to, to stage one. The first thing we're going to do in stage one view setup is we're going to go back to that graph projection and we're just going to make it look better. And again, the graph projection has no impact on the flight. It doesn't change the outcome of the flight. It only changes the way the graphics look. But since we have the eject plan up, we're going to set the graph projection to plan so that so that the, the graphics are using the plan, basically. So we're just going to press plus as many times as it takes to get around a plan. You know, they're getting, they go in a circle. So eventually you'll get there. Uh, if you want, while you're in view setup, you can also go to the scale to view and change it to target, which just gives you a zoomed in view. It's optional. You don't have to do that. Then we're going to press VW to get back over to the escape plan. And we're going to go through the variables and set them up as needed. So VAR over to PE distance. Now the PE, the PE distance will default. Let me just check that real quick. No problem. 
Uh, the PE distance will default to 7 point something. Uh, again, since I've already started to record this video one time, I have it set. Uh, the PE distance that we want at Earth is going to be about 200 kilometers. You could go even a little bit higher than that if you wanted to, say 250 or 300, uh, or even lower. You could go down to 180. But 200 is a nice round number. It's easy to figure out what you need the PE distance to be. So the radius is 6.371, and 200 greater than that is 6.571. So with the PE distance up, and again, the default will be 7 point something, just press the Enter button. Then type in 6571E3, or you can just do 000. Either way, you get the same result. So now we have the PE distance set. And uh, if this seems very familiar to you, then good. That means you've already watched the uh, Moon to Earth video using Transex, and we're basically doing the same thing. So if these, you should be in familiar territory, and that's why it's important that you've already watched those videos, because now you're looking at this stuff and you're thinking, oh, I've already done all this, it's easy. Once the PE distance is set, then we're going to press VAR to get over to the eject orientation. Now this is going to work a little bit differently than it did on the moon, but we'll, we'll explain that. Uh, it generally helps to have the, the most adjustment that you can have at the beginning, so let's go to rough. And we're just going to swing that white line around until it lies over top of the green. It's getting really close. So I'm going to go down to a course adjustment now. And we're pretty well lined up right there. Now, according to this, uh, according to this arrangement, we would have a launch heading of 137.9, so basically 138 degrees. That's uh, south uh, southeast, rather. And we can check the other direction as well, but I already know that it's not going to be better than that. The other direction will just simply be 180 degrees opposite of that, but let's check it just to show that. If we swing the white line around this way, do an adjustment, and about right there. Now we can see that the heading is 317.9, uh, and that's northwest. That's especially bad, and let me just talk briefly about that. When we were on the moon, our velocity from where we were at on Brighton Beach was only, you know, three meters per second, three, four meters per second. Notice here, we're sitting on the runway, we're not moving, but Earth is rotating. And Earth is rotating from our position, and, the, the, and this is the reason I'm mentioning the position is because the rotational velocity changes depending on your launch site. So if we were actually on the equator, our rotational velocity would be even higher than this. And if we we're further north, let's say we were at the... Uh, uh, Wallops Island launch site, it would be a little bit lower than that because that's a little bit farther north. But from this launch site, our quote-unquote velocity is uh, almost 408 meters per second. Now, if we take off and fly, uh, let's say we take off and fly straight west. So that means the Earth's rotating this way, and we're flying backwards against the rotation. We're going to lose all that rotational velocity, and I think it might even be times two because uh, we're not only are we losing it, but we're actually going backwards. I'm not sure if it works that way or not. But at the very least, we would be losing 407 meters per, 408 meters per second if we were flying straight west. Now, if we do it, if we fly the other direction, if we fly straight east, we would be gaining. Uh, we would have 408 meters of second of velocity for free. So instead of costing us, let's just say, 7,800 meters per second and that doesn't include gravity loss or atmospheric loss. But let's say that it costs us 7,800 meters per second to get up to orbit around Earth. Then instead of 7,800, it would actually cost us closer to 7,400 because we're getting this much for free. And whereas if we go the other direction, it would cost us like 8,200, I think. So it, the ideal heading to have is 90 degrees. But we can't always get a 90 degree heading. In fact, we see that here uh, with the white line swung either direction. We're not seeing a 90 degree heading. This is one of the reasons that we, we move our date 24 hours prior to the actual eject date. Because remember the eject date was actually uh, 57423.0. And when we set the time in the simulator, we set it to 57422. So one day prior to the launch date. And the reason we do that is because we want to wait. We want to sit here on the pad. We don't want to move until we can get the best heading that we can get. 
and again the best heading would be 90.00 but we can't always get that it depends on the launch date it depends on um, your your latitude where you're at on earth so we may not be able to get 90 degrees but we want to get as close to 90 degrees as we can so what we want to do is we want to swing the white line around until it's until it until we currently have the best heading we can get and this is actually currently the worst heading we can get so let's go the other direction with it so right about here and so that's 138 that's you know that's pretty far off from 90 degrees that's uh, 48 degrees that's almost that's almost a 45 degree angle from 90. that's not horrible it's be certainly better than going backwards, you know, flying west. But if we can get even better than that, we would like to. And the fact of the matter is we have almost one full day until we're going to, until we need to do the eject. So let's just warp time forward at a factor of 100. And you'll notice what will happen is this line will start moving. So we can kind of carefully track it even, even while we're at time warp. We can kind of continually move the... Uh, white line around and currently you can see it's actually getting worse but that's okay because we still have a whole you know we still have a half of a day to go to find out if we're going to get a better heading or not let's go back to a thousand time warp and remember the the other heading would always be exactly opposite of this one so if this ends up being 270 or close to 270 then we actually know that all we have to do is swing the white line around 180 degrees and then we'll have a 90 degree heading Let's continue warp time forward. Currently, the heading is uh, basically straight south. That's terrible. So let's keep going forward. So our two options would be straight south or straight north, and we don't want either of those. Okay, now things are kind of turning around. So what I want to do is come out of time warp and then swing the white line around until I find my, my two positions, or at least one of them. And one of them is going to be right here. That's uh, 17 degrees, 18 degrees, 20 degrees. So hopefully if we warp time forward a little bit more, we can get at least, you know, 65 or 70 degrees. And we've still got a half day to go. Notice our eject date is a uh, 423 and we're still at 422. And the fact of the matter is if you actually miss the eject date by a half of a day or even a full day, it doesn't matter. Once we get up into orbit around Earth, we're going to set up a maneuver anyway that will replace this plan. And then we'll do we'll do a whole new set of calculations for how to get to Mars. And the the, long, the opportunity to get to Mars is pretty wide. Uh, we, it, it's not important that we hit this eject date exactly. We can be off by a week or even ten days. It doesn't matter. It's 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 better if we can get a good um, a good launch heading. So let's go forward some more. And now as a, notice our heading is getting closer to ninety. That's great. I don't know how close it's going to get exactly, but uh, we'll just keep going forward until it stops getting better. It's starting to slow down now. Now we're at uh, almost 50 degrees. And you just you have to keep up with that white line with the you know the current position. So make sure you do that. And now it looks like it's actually starting to go back down. Okay, yeah, it's actually starting to go down. So as we go farther forward now, our heading is going to actually go down. It's going to get farther away from 90. And that's not what we want. So we either need to take this heading, uh, we need to take, we need to launch now, or we need to say that we're going to skip this eject date and go for a different date. As an absolute beginner, again, in order to get things done, I would actually recommend that you go ahead and take this uh, heading, whatever it is, even though it's not perfect, it's not ideal, it's 40 degrees off from where we want to be. So that means our ride to orbit's not going to be as cheap as it would be otherwise. But we're going to take this. Actually, I do see the heading going up a little bit, but I, but I didn't notice it was actually, as I continue to move the white line forward, yeah, it's, go, it's going down. So we need, to, we need to take this heading. So that's the, that's the other part of the, that's the step, or step two, but it's actually the first part of the plan is to figure out how to get into orbit. And we now have that. So let's go ahead and get underway. Um, I think we still have time to do the ride to orbit in this video, yeah. Let me drag my joystick over, because I don't like to fly with the keyboard. It's just weird. And we're going to press F8 to get over to the uh, this view. 
and we're going to come down to the bottom panel. We're going to turn off external cooling. Using onboard O2. And one thing we can do, um, we can actually do like a like a re-entry check just to make sure that everything's closed up, which I think is nine. Re-entry check failed. Well, obviously we need the landing gear down, but everything else is closed. The nose cone is closed. The radiator is closed. The retro doors are closed. The scram doors are closed. Everything's closed that needs to be closed except the, the landing gear is down, and, but that we need the landing gear to be down, obviously. All right, so let's turn on the APU. That'll give us access, that'll allow the surface controls to work. Let's make sure rotation is off because that'll kind of be weird if we don't have that on. And Gosh. surface controls on. And I have my throttle partially set. And let me just check something here. Okay, I was just making sure I have a I have a, a little script that runs in the background that, that allows my joystick keys to be mapped to orbiter. I just wanted to make sure that was running. I'm gonna switch the HUD color because I know that as I climb up through the atmosphere, that yellow is not going to be visible. So what we're going to do here is we're gonna take off and we're gonna to get to you know the normal velocity of 150 meters per second or something like that, and then we're gonna pitch back. And we're going to immediately bank to the right in order to get over to that 50 uh, degree heading. Once we're approximately on the heading, we're no longer going to worry about flying at that particular heading. In fact, like I said in one of my other videos, if you have to, once you get to that point, put a piece of tape across the uh, heading display so that you're not looking at it. The only thing we care about once we get close to that heading is what is our relative inclination. We need to keep our relative inclination low. All right, uh, just a quick sanity check. We have the fuel that we need. We have the locks that we need, and we're ready to go. So again, we're going to take off. We're going to go to about one. Uh, we're going to go to a heading of about 50. All right, let's do this. Full power on the main. 100 knots. And again, we're looking for about um, not 150 meters per second. I think that was V1. Bring the throttle back so we don't. Uh, there's rotate. Bring the throttle back so you don't overstress the gear as you take off. Wheels up. Once you get wheels up, get to about 10 meters. Are you kidding me? I hit the wrong button. On. Okay, I hit the wrong button. I meant to raise my landing gear, but I accidentally shut the shut the APU off. Gear up and locked. Okay, once the gear is up and locked, we're gonna bank to the uh, right, and we're gonna start getting over to the heading that we need, which is a 50, it was like 50 degrees. But it's more important that we watch that relative inclination, but we do need to get to the right heading first. Okay, I overshot it a little bit. Full power on the main so we can climb up out of the atmosphere. Now we're approximately on the right heading, so now I'm just gonna put all my focus on whatever the relative inclination is. And it'll start coming down here. There it is. Might even want to bank a bit more to the right. Okay, again, my focus is a few things here. Let me switch the color too, because once you get up to a certain point in the atmosphere, I, I kind of wish the colors would change automatically, but. Again, we're going for an altitude of about 15 kilometers initially because we are going to do a scram ascent. Uh, there, there can be fuel problems even with the default XR2 if you burn up too much of your main fuel. Um, so we're about 15 kilometers, we'll level off. Watching the relative inclination there. I should have pitched up a little bit more aggressively than this. But that's okay. It's actually been quite a while since I've flown the XR2 up into orbit. Now we're going to level off, and we'll probably be level at about 20 kilometers, actually even before then, it looks like. But if you don't use your scram fuel, then uh, it's a total waste to even carry it in the first place. And you want to use your scram fuel so that you can save the main. Okay, we're at about close to 20 kilometers it's not bad so once we reach uh, Mach 3 we'll open the scram doors 
and begin the scram ascent. Now, one thing I'll mention here, there's Mach 3. Let's open the scram doors. And you can actually press Control plus to increase the scram, and then as you do that, pull back on the main engines. And then watch your heat. You will overheat very quickly when you use the scram fuel, because notice our acceleration is all the way up to, you know, it, you accelerate very quickly. But there is a there is a certain you know uh, like a like a launch profile that you want to try to fly with the scram engines you don't want to climb so fast that uh, you get really high because the higher you get the less efficient the scram engines can burn and you'll end up in orbit with uh, you know half of your scram fuel and that's bad so notice that my notice this temperature readout I'm, I'm not worried about it until it like gets into the red but so I'm, it's yellow right now and I'm fine with that I'm just trying not to climb too fast because if you climb, you know, watch my vertical speed. It's 291 meters a second. I'm going to pitch the nose back down because I don't want to climb any faster than I am right now. There's something else I'll mention about that relative inclination here in a moment. But first, let's get our, our ascent under control, which looks pretty good right about here. So one thing I want to mention about the uh, right to orbit with regards to the relative inclination. Notice how this white line is kind of, it's, it's trending behind us. Um, don't lose track of your temperature while you're looking over here. This white, the, our, so this relative inclination is no longer accurate. It says 6.4, but it's, it's not exactly what our actual relative inclination is because that white line is a bit off. You, if you adjust your eject orientation, you might have to put it onto a, a fine setting, you know, because media might be too much, but re- recenter that white line back over your current position and that will give you the accurate uh, that's what our relative inclination is right now this very second and I tend to do that a few times as I'm go going up to the ride to orbit and the reason the white line trails behind us is because we're moving our position we're not sitting in one place and the earth is rotating notice our temperature is fine we're all the way down into the green so I'm just gonna kinda go down to, a, to where the velocity vector is right on the horizon that way I'm really not climbing too much. I'm just gaining velocity. Got our vertical speed all the way down to just 40 meters a second. We do want to continually climb in a little bit because we will overheat if we don't. But we don't want to climb too fast because otherwise you just won't burn. You won't use up all your scram fuel and you'll end up in orbit with a bunch of scram fuel left over. That's really inefficient. Now we're, we are warming up a bit so I want to watch that. We're getting close to that red point. And I'm going to do a bit of a bank here. I'm just going to, yeah, I'm going to bank a bit to the left. I'm going to bring that relative inclination down faster. And again, I'm going to go ahead and swing that line around just a little bit more. One thing, I'll, what the, one thing to note, when the relative inclination gets down to 1.0 or lower, this swinging the line gets really sensitive so you want to change the adjustment from medium all the way down to you know super or ultra banking a lot to bring down the relative inclination and just to kind of eliminate some of that vertical speed because notice our vertical speed got up pretty high and, the, and it may look like we're banking really aggressively, but you got to take into account our altitude. You know, we're really high up, so there's not a lot of atmosphere up here. Now the relative inclination is all the way down to 1.8, so that, that line of nodes is going to get very sensitive at this point. I'm going to go ahead and go back to more of a level position because I don't want to overshoot the, uh, the relative inclination. Now we're actually dropping a little bit. We definitely don't want to descend. And I'm intentionally slowing down the descent of the relative inclination. I don't want it to drop so fast that it overshoots and spins around the other way. Uh, ooh, definitely need to watch the temperature. Notice we are very close to the red point. And now I'm going to carefully carefully swing that line around, do an adjustment to bring it down to fine because it's getting very sensitive. Our 
I heard the scram fuel low. That's fine. Okay, we burned through all of our scram fuel. You always, that's, that's the best outcome. Now back to full power on the main. If you carry even one drop of scram fuel with you into orbit, it's not the best thing to do. And you want to dump it as soon as you get into orbit. Because once you're in orbit, scram fuel has no more use. It's just dead mass. It's like carrying concrete, you know, or lead weights or something. And there's just no point in having it. Keeping an eye on the relative inclination. We can also bring up orbit MFD to start watch. So we can start paying attention to our, you know, how close we are to orbital velocity. Relative inclinations down to just a, you know, 0.5, about a half degree at this point. And once we complete the ride to orbit, that'll be the end of this part of the video. Uh, also, once the scram ascent is complete, it's not a bad idea to kind of pitch up a little bit and start getting up higher, you know, up to 75, 80 kilometers, because there's no point in being down in the lower part of the atmosphere when you're not doing a scram ascent it's you're just getting a lot of drag for no reason okay watching that white line notice how it's starting to swing around now that means we're getting very very close to being uh in perfect plane with our with our target so we need to fly carefully at this point and watch our apoapsis so that we don't you know burn too long and now i'm going to do it a bit of an adjustment here i'm going to swing that line around Set it a little bit ahead of myself, actually. Now, basically, the only thing I can concern myself with is the apoapsis. Everything else has to be forgotten. So I'm watching the APA over here. And throttle back. We can throttle back. We can cut the engines at about 190, 192, 193, about right here. Because the, the shape of the vessel, the shape of the XR2, will continue to give us lift while we're still at this in this part of the atmosphere. Notice our apoapsis will continue to climb, even though we're getting a little bit of drag from the atmosphere, but we're also getting a little bit of lift. So it'll probably increase our apoapsis, but decrease our periapsis, and that's fine. All right, so really, once you reach this point, there's nothing you can do. Um, it, I kind of like to keep real close track of my relative inclination, because since we are getting some, some uh, effect from the atmosphere if we pitch our vessel one way or the other now we need to turn off surface controls and go to rotation we can actually use this little bit of atmosphere that we have left to bring our relative inclination down the rest of the way it's a bit of an advanced technique so you don't have to worry about this but notice the relative inclination is still coming down and i'm not even burning any engines burning any engines right now but the reason it's coming down is because the uh, vessel is slicing through this little trace amount of atmosphere that we have left up here. And that's helping to bring the relative inclination the rest of the way down. Looks like we can go full, uh, full prograde basically at this point. Yeah, we'll go with that. And so we re arrived in orbit with a relative inclination of just 0 .02, uh, 0 0.027. That's not bad. And it's going to continue to go down for a little while. All right. Now, uh, once you reach orbit, um, orbital velocity, one of the first things you're going to want to do is open your radiator. You, there's a, you, you don't want to open it too soon because you will have... You could run into some serious problems if you do. But once you're above 85, 90 kilometers, it's definitely safe to open the radiator. So open it, and then you can turn off your APU to save that fuel. Now I'm going to go ahead and pause the simulation because things happen quickly because we're moving. Move the joystick out of the way, and we'll come when we come back, we will take a look at what we need to do uh, once you know from this point forward. Because again, we do it, the only thing we've accomplished so far is we took off from the runway, we flew to the heading that we needed to fly to, we kept our relative inclination as low as we could while we were going up into orbit, but now we have to figure out have to figure out how we can go from orbit out to Mars. That's a pretty tall order. If you like this part of the video, like it, and if you didn't like it, don't like it. It's cool. And check for links in the description down below. Leave your comments, questions, all that good stuff in the comments area, and I will see you in the next video.